Come, let us all unite to sing, God is love. Let heaven and earth the praises bring, God is love. Let every soul from sin away, each in his heart, sweet music make. And sing with us, for Jesus' sake, God is love. O oh, tell to earth's remotest bound, God is love. In Christ we have redemption found, God is love. His blood has washed our sins away, his spirit turned our night to day. And now we can rejoice to say, God is love. How happy is our portion here, God is love. His promises our spirits cheer, God is love. He is our sun and shield by day, our help, our hope, our strength, our stay. He will be with us all the way. God is love. Our focus is on 1 John chapter 4. Here you see the NIV subheadings for 1 John on the left-hand side, and there are 12 subheadings. And on the right-hand column, you see the New King James Version's 22 subheadings. I should tell you that the author acknowledged to be the Apostle John is a senior citizen at this point in time and he is writing to the churches in Asia because well there are two main reasons one is that he is trying to keep them faithful to the fellowship to encourage them to remain faithful to the fellowship but more urgently I think is the idea that there are false teachers who are infiltrating the churches this is not new we know that the Apostle Paul wrote to these churches and also had to make a defense of the authority of himself and then the authority of the understanding, the teachings, because many were bringing various alternatives. First, there are the Judaizers who were trying to insist that since Christianity was, from their perspective, a sect within Judaism that you had to convert to Judaism first and follow the Jewish rituals and the Jewish laws in order to become and be considered Christian. And then there were the Gnostics, those who thought you needed some special knowledge and this special knowledge would give you a greater relationship or better relationship with God. So you had to come through them and their way of thinking to get this knowledge in order to be elevated into a clearer understanding of who God is. There was a lot of error there. And what we see John doing in the beginning of the epistle is exercising his own authority, stating that he was an eyewitness and that none of these individuals who were teaching these alternative approaches and perspectives were around at the time. Again, if John is in his 80s, say, then he is telling them, younger people, that they need to... <laughs> move aside and listen to the actual reality of what took place. The purpose is to promote the fellowship among the believers in Asia and to protect these believers from these false teachers, the Judaizers and the Gnostics, who were making claims about their knowledge of the nature of God and the nature of Jesus. John makes a statement in chapter 1 that he is given an eyewitness perspective because he says, that which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and we have handled. So he's establishing his own legitimacy. But something else he observed in this letter, I think is intriguing. John uses the word liar as frequently in this one short letter as Paul uses it in 13 letters. This tells me that he is concerned. He is concerned about the fact that these false teachers are infiltrating the ranks and what they're doing is dangerous and it needs to be stopped. Now remember Paul spoke to this issue and this is several years later and he is still having to speak to this issue. So that means that the issue did not go away. To be calling these people liars as frequently as he does strongly states that he is not pleased but he wants it to stop. So that's where we start. Again to give a brief outline of the letter we notice in chapter 1 there's no greeting or any other introduction and at the end, there's no final greeting. There's no author's name included. And uh, as you read the sentences, you realize that there's a lack of connective conjunctions between the various sentences. This makes it read more like Proverbs. And there are people who have argued that it is a series of aphorisms, short, pithy statements. But the main theme is love or charity. This is what St. Augustine said about the letter. 
Calvin, John Calvin also referred to it as a compound of doctrine and exhortation. And he acknowledged there's a lack of a discernible sequence of thought as you read through the epistle. One more contemporary scholar wrote, attempts to trace a consecutive argument throughout 1 John have never succeeded. At best, we can distinguish three main courses of thought. The first, chapters 1 and 2, which has two main themes, ethical, walking in the light, and Christological, confessing Christ. The second is chapter 2, verse 28, to chapter 4, verse 6, which repeats the ethical and the Christological themes with variations. And third, the passage we're going to look at is included here. It presents the same two essential themes as love and faith and show them to be inseparable and indispensable products of a life in Christ. Another scholar says one could move around units almost at will and still First John would read just as well as it does now. So you can move things around in the epistle and it would read the same way. Again, sort of like Proverbs, I say. For the record, I firmly believe it to be the inspired word of God and I personally claim no scholarship in this area. Therefore, I have to go with what others have said. Even if it seems controversial, there's no point in hiding the controversy. We don't argue about Proverbs very much, do we? In fact, you rarely hear sermons preach on Proverbs because of the fact that they're aphorisms. But we hear sermons on First John because, well, I guess the main theme is important. If there's error, it needs to be dealt with. And secondly, we need to learn to love each other and get along as Christians. So that is what I see as the main ideas contained in this passage. The link between the love of God for us and our regard for others is manifest through the following text from 1 John chapter 4. In verse 7 it says, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Our knowing God should spill out into the world as love. Any absence of love must indicate a lack in our relationship with God. Jesus is at the center of our understanding God and loving others. So let's take a look at the scripture passage. And I start with the NIV quickly to read it through. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Interesting, huh? Let's switch translations. We're going to read the same passage from the Amplified Bible, starting at verse 7 of chapter 4. Beloved, let us unselfishly love and seek the best for one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves others is born of God and knows God through personal experience. The one who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him. For God is love. He is the originator of love and it is an enduring attribute of his nature. By this, the love of God was displayed in us in that God has sent his one and only begotten Son, the one who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, into the world so that we might live through him. 
In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, that is, the atoning sacrifice and the satisfying offering for our sins, fulfilling God's requirement for justice against sin and placating his wrath. Beloved, if God so loved us in this incredible way, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another with unselfish concern, God abides in us, and his love, the love that is his essence, abides in us, and is completed and perfected in us. By this we know with confident assurance that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his Holy Spirit. We who were with him in person have seen and testify as eyewitnesses that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses and acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know by personal observation and experience, and have believed with deep and consistent faith, the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides continually in him. In this union and fellowship with him, love is completed and perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out all fear, because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates, works against his Christian brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should also unselfishly love his brother and seek the best for him. And now I want to switch to the Living Bible. Dear friends, let us practice loving each other, for love comes from God, and those who are loving and kind show that they are the children of God, and that they are getting to know him better. But if a person isn't loving and kind, it shows that he doesn't know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into this wicked world to bring to us eternal life through his death. In this act, we see what real love is. It is not our love for God, but his love for us when he sent his son to satisfy God's anger against our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us as much as that, we surely ought to love each other too. For though we have never seen God, when we love each other, God lives in us, and his love within us grows ever stronger. And he has put his own spirit into our hearts as a proof to us that we are living with him and he with us. And furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now tell all the world that God sent his son to be their savior. Anyone who believes and says that Jesus is the son of God has God living in him and he is living with God. We know how much God loves us because we have felt his love and because we believe him when he tells us that he loves us dearly. God is love and anyone who lives in love is living with God and God is living in him. And as we live with Christ, our love grows more perfect and complete. So we will not be ashamed and embarrassed at the day of judgment, but can face him with confidence and joy because he loves us and we love him too. We need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. If we are afraid, it is for fear of what he might do to us and shows that we are not fully convinced that he really loves us. So, you see, our love for him comes as a result of his loving us first. If anyone says, I love God, but keeps on hating his brother, he is a liar. For if he does not love his brother, who is right here in front of him, how can he love God, whom he has never seen? And God himself has said that one must love not only God, but his brother too. So given the background context that John is writing to promote the brotherhood within the fellowship and also to protect the believers from the teachings of these false teachers, Gnostics and Judaizers. John is trying to protect the congregations from error and it is as though he is close to the end of his own life and he is saying, this is my last chance to remind you. The same way a father might talk to his children and say, okay, 
this is the way I raised you and I want you to continue to keep these values and make me a death dead promise that you will actually do this. So he's encouraging them to stay on the straight and narrow, so to speak. What does it mean in verse 7 to be born of God and to know God? Going back to the Living Bible, John writes, let us practice loving each other for love comes from God and those who are loving and kind show that they are children of God and that they are getting to know him better. To be born of God then is to be a child of God. Let's go back to John chapter 3 verses 3 through 6 where Jesus is having a conversation with a Pharisee named Nicodemus and he says you must be born again. So to be born of God and to be born again are the same idea and the author on both of these letters is John. So John is making a connection here. The same way Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He is saying that anyone who is in a relationship with God, wants to be in a relationship with God, must be born again. To be born of God then means to be born again. He also says that you must know God. In the NIV it says, everyone who loves has been born of God, and knows God. In the Living Bible it says, those who are loving and kind show that they are children of God. And they're getting to know him better. You can see the difference in the structure here. Everyone who loves is born of God. Here it says, those who love show they're children of God. So to me it's a clearer exposition. Those who are loving and kind show that they are children of God and that they're getting to know him better. So the getting to know him better is certainly different than they know God. To say you know God means that you know all there is to know, or suggests that you know all there is to know. But what the Living Bible does with that verse, it says, by being loving and kind, you show that you are a child of God and that you are getting to know God better. If you are not loving and kind, it shows that you don't know God, because God is love. So it establishes first that God is love, and that if you know God, then you will be loving and kind, or you will get to know him better and that you will show you are a child of God. It's not exactly linear here, but you get the sense that the idea is that love coming from God helps you to be a loving person, and this shows that you are getting to know God better. The second question I have is, what's the difference between knowing God and knowing about God? And it may not be a real question because there are many people you know about, but you don't know them. So knowing is an intimacy that knowing about is not. And you can know about a person, even know a lot about them because you've done the research or you've seen them, but you don't actually know them. You don't know the deep inner thoughts and secrets and feelings and you don't have that connection. You don't have the relationship. So you can't really say you know that person, you know about that person. On a regular basis, then, there are many people I meet that I know about, but I don't know them. I think that is pretty straightforward. You need intimacy to get to the stage where you know someone, and you can know them, know about them based on just knowledge, research you've done, and hopefully the research will give you enough to say that you know about this person, but you don't know the person. Let us unselfishly love and seek the best for one another. <laughs> what a start. Let us improve our relationships with each other, he said. Because this love comes from God. And if we love God and are born of God, then we will love others. Let us seek the best for each other. If you love God, do you manifest that love for God by loving others and seeking the best for them? The Amplified Bible says unselfishly. This is a tall order, to love unselfishly. Those who you might not know that well, but because you are in a relationship with God, you're going to trust these individuals and trust that they will not take advantage of you. The one who does not love has not become acquainted with God. As you become acquainted with God, you learn to love. But I don't like the idea that it's presenting love as a fait accompli. And this is why I like what the Living Bible has done. Practice. So read that one more time, verse 7. Let us practice loving each other. That's the main idea in verse 7. 
those who are loving and kind show that they are children of God. Those who are succeeding in the practice of being loving and kind show themselves to be children of God. Where and how? By the desire to succeed at this thing. It is not going to happen extemporaneously. That's why the Living Bible says, let's practice loving each other. There's some people who you don't care for as much as others. And you have to practice loving them. So that you get to a place where you say, okay, well, I love this person as much as I love someone else. It's probably not going to happen that you love everyone equally. There's some relationships that are closer. There's some people who are easier to get along with. And as a result, you gravitate towards them. I think of when the Jews came up to Antioch and Peter, who was getting along with the Gentiles there and eating with them, slinked back and went to eat with the Jewish brothers who came up from Jerusalem. And Paul got on his case and said, you're being a hypocrite. <laughs> you know, when they're here, you socialize well with everybody else and now they are here and you are segregating yourself from the Gentile Christians. And Paul let him have it with both barrels. Let's go to verse 9. Verse 9 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into this wicked world to bring us eternal life through his death. In this act, we see what real love is. It is not our love for God, but his love for us when he sent his son to satisfy God's anger against our sins. The connection is clear then that the purpose of Jesus coming Yes, we do spend a lot of time and resources getting the joy, getting the good feeling of, yeah, God sent his son into the world. Yeah, Christmas. In order that he might die. The reason he came is to give us eternal life. Not through his living, but through his dying. To be the Paschal Lamb, once for all. So the sacrificial system could be eliminated forever. And all we need to do is to apply what Jesus did to ourselves. And as a result of that application, we are saved. Isn't that great? You don't have to be sacrificed or you don't have to have a sacrifice. Jesus paid it all. The next question asks, how are we to relate to those who neither know God or live in God? Verse 13 of the passage says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. So we know and rely on the love God has for us. So how do we relate to those who neither know God nor live in God? Here is where I think that we need to go and tell. The next question asks, how is loving others evidence of God? God living in us. Verse 16 says, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So how is loving others evidence of God living in us? If we have love in our hearts, then the things that we would do would reflect God. Loving others, evidence of God living in us. The human nature manifest itself by having you be as human as you can be, not as godly as you can be. So having God live in you causes you to love others. So you are forgiving to those who are unkind, turn the other cheek. You're loving to those who are unlovable. You're striving to please God in the way you live your life. Loving others is an outflow of God living in you. It's as though you have now the energy and the charge to do the things that you would not normally do because it's not your nature. So God gives you a new nature, a nature to go and be loving to others who are, by many standards, not worthy of you loving them. But God's grace flowing through you, his love flowing through you, is a channel. You are the channel. This river is flowing. So imagine a time of no rainfall and the river is dry then there's a lot of rain and the dry water bed becomes a raging river the energy the resource coming through you flows to others you're designed 
to be a channel. But with no water, you're channeling nothing, air. And now that the resource is there, you're serving, you're fulfilling on the purpose for which you were created to be a channel. Channels only, blessed master. But with all thy wondrous power flowing through me, thou canst use me every day and every hour.